While Indians in colonial India struggled for independence from the British, the Indian princes in princely India partied with the British. During these decades, for instance, the Maharaj of Bharatpur organized Christmas shoots at their Kyolodev birth sanctuary Bharatpur, where viceroys and princes vied with each other and compared how many ducks and grouse and geese each shot. The Maharaj of Patiala had his jewels set by the French jeweler Cartier. The Maharaj of Alwar bought several Rolls Royce, while several others spent months holidaying in the Riviera and designing palaces, complete with their Ferragamo shoes. Why are we talking about the Indian princes though? Hello, my name is Priya Mirza and this podcast is The Longest Constitution. In today's episode, we are resuming mapping the history of the fundamental right to property, that's Article 31, and looking into the fundamental right to movement under Article 19, Part 1, Part D, and how sedition found its way into the Indian Penal Code. Okay, our first story today circles around the freedom of movement, and we saw how the Gundas Act is a law which strikes at the very heart of the right to movement within India because it allows the state to arbitrarily detain people. But this story is about the movement out of India. It's the 1960s. Satwan Singh Sani is an importer and exporter of automobile parts who needs to travel abroad because that's his work. Except that India had no specific legal framework to grant passports. And Satwan Sani was denied a passport, yeah. So, under the Constitution of India, the only reference to movement is Article 19, Part 1, Part D, which grants citizens the freedom to move freely throughout the territory of India. But when the Constitution was being drafted, partition took place, which raised questions about territory, movement and migration. So, by the way, the centrality of partition is visible in Part 2 of the Constitution, which deals with citizenship which also allows migrants from Pakistan to return through any means, air, rail, sea or on foot. So, Article 19, Part 1, Part D was a carefully thought out provision which granted the right to movement but just within India. And much of the legal confusion around passports in India stems from this period. So, neither was there a law on acquiring a passport or a fundamental right to fly abroad which implied a passport at least. Okay, now on to the Indian princes. And the history of property is at the heart of power. And nothing encapsulates it better than the wayward lives the Indian princes led, or at least most of them, and the tedious negotiations that Sardar Patel with VP Menon engineered. India as we know it today, when hundreds of Indian princes acceded to the Indian Union, in return for a constitutional assurance that they would receive a tax-free allowance from the government, which was stylishly called a privy purse. So let's connect the dots. So first, why was the R.C. Cooper case as important as it was? The R.C. Cooper case saw the Supreme Court taking on Parliament. And this assertion of the judiciary for the right to compensation was a bit too much for Parliament to handle. And Parliament responded by belling the cat. So right from the Kameshwar Prasad case, that's 1950, the point of conflict over the state acquiring private land was whether the compensation was fair or not. And after two decades of the courts striking down acquisitions with illusory compensations, Parliament responded with the 25th Amendment. When the word compensation in Article 31 Part 2 was substituted by the word amount. And this meant that the courts were henceforth pushed out. And much of this was possible because following the 1971 elections, the Congress commanded 352 seats of the 518 member Lok Sabha, making it easier for the Congress to pass amendments. Which also points to the threat to the constitution placed by a majoritarian government. Now that sounds familiar. And it was in response to this that the Swatantra Party, India's first conservative party, was put together by C. Rajagopalachari with a diverse set of members. Minu Masani, a Parsi educated at LSC, passionately committed to upholding the constitutional vision of a liberal India. 
R.C. Cooper, of whom we have heard, he had a PhD in economics and was deeply suspicious of Indira Gandhi socialism. Plus, a number of Indian princes such as the Maharaja of Patiala, the Raja of Ramgarh and at least one Indian princess, Gayatri Devi. The Swatantra Party was formed by wealthy, liberal people, passionate, well-read, academically inclined people who could in fact take on the socialist policies of the Congress Party. Except that the Congress Party had plans of its own as far as the princely members were concerned. And that was the abolishment of the privy purse of the Indian princes guaranteed in the constitution. Okay, our third story today continues with looking at provisions that restrict our fundamental right to expression but are not in the constitution. The year is 1871 and James Fitzjames Stephen, an English Cambridge educated barrister, is appointed as the legislative member at the Governor General's Council. From Fort William, he writes to his wife, who is in England, about the zeal and passion with which he is filled for his task ahead in India. And he does just that. The drafting and enactment of the Indian Evidence Act of 1872, the Indian Contract Act of 1872 and the revision of the Criminal Procedure Code in 1872 were his doing. But along with this, he also noticed the absence of sedition in the Indian Penal Code. In 1871, he was instrumental in the insertion of Section 124A into the IPC, which criminalized offenses against the state. And that is the act of sedition. Interestingly, though, in England, there was no such offence of sedition known to English law. Seditious offences were categorised as seditious words, seditious libels and seditious conspiracies. And even though Section 124A was inserted into the IPC in 1870, there was no prosecution or trial under that section for 21 years until 1891. And following that, of course, Tilak Gandhi and scores of other nationalist leaders were charged with sedition. Okay, so let's get back to the fundamental right to movement. So while the Gundas Act allows the state to extern a person from a particular area within India, the absence of a passport act meant that getting a passport was entirely at the discretion of the Ministry of External Affairs. Leaving the country was very tightly controlled. Except that Satwan Sani moved the Supreme Court with a very capable lawyer. Soli Surabji, who argued that the actions against his client were a violation of Article 14 and 21, which establishes the right to life and personal liberty. So let's start to wrap things up. What happened to sedition when the constitution was being drafted? In the Constituent Assembly, while sedition was dropped as a ground for a reasonable restriction in what later became Article 19, it continued to remain in force simply because Parliament did not strike it down. In Satwan Sani v. D. Ramaratnam, 1967, in the Supreme Court of India, Justice K. Subarao ruled that the right to fly abroad is indeed part of Article 21, the right to life and personal liberty. And following this, the Passport Act of 1967 was passed. And in 1970, in Parliament, Y.B. Chavan moved for leave for the 24th Amendment to delete from the Constitution the provisions which granted the Indian princes a privy purse. So today's takeaways are, sedition continues to cripple free speech in India today. The Satwan Sani case contributed to the expansion of the fundamental right to liberty and movement. The Privy Purse's case was emblematic of a majoritarian government keen to demonstrate how socialist it was, even at the constitutional guarantees made to the Indian princes. More of this in the next episode. If you have questions or comments, please send them in via email. That's the longest constitution at gmail.com. You can also rate my podcast at Spotify and drop a review at Apple Podcasts. And can also reach out to me on Twitter, where I am at fundamentally p or on Instagram, The Longest Constitution. Until next time, this is me, Priya Mirza, signing out. <laughs>